about the background of sound painting, in particular how you came to develop a series of signs that would modify and create a performance and a composition. You, the birth of sound painting, yeah. in other words. The birth of sound painting was in 1974 in Woodstock, New York, where I formed a, a, an orchestra there during the summer of 1974. Musicians and dancers from the Creative Music School. And the dancers were, the instructions for the dancers were to improvise in relationship to, with a relationship to music. And for the musicians of about 20 or so, there were seven dancers, about 20 or so musicians. Mm -hmm. I wrote some small fragments that, that we were to, you know, to relate to with improvisation or to build off of in some kind of way. And during the, during the first concert, after a few rehearsals during the first concert, mm -hmm. uh, the instructions were if, if it was a soloist, you were supposed to make a relationship to the notation. Mm -hmm. And the first soloist didn't do that, so I found, I, I wanted to, I was a little bit frustrated that that happened, and so I wanted to steer the the composition back to my sort of original idea of, of what it would be. And in the moment I pointed at a few people and made this long tone gesture, thinking that the musicians would understand. And then I said, play like this, and it worked. Excellent. So how did the soloist who was improvising supposedly in relationship to your score, how did that person react? Well, it, it, the, the person, the trumpeter, who, who was the first person to improvise, and not follow these rules I had set up to improvise thematically based on my notation. Uh, uh, he realized that there was, you know, these long tone pads, these long tones, this texture underneath him, and of course it affected his uh, improvisation, which was what my goal was, was to, in a way, steer something underneath him that would affect him in some way. So constantly your signs and your frustrations, as it were, were to bring the piece back to your idea, your ownership, your composition, fundamentally. Right, exactly, to, to, to bring it back to, to sort of the, the basic material that I was looking for, you know, whether it was improvisation or whether it was notation, sort of the basic skeleton I was trying to keep alive. And also just a few minutes after doing you, 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 long tone, I did you, 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 pointillism, and said play, and that also worked. Yeah, so. Yeah. so, considering your um, development of the signs within a particular context, which other composers or performers do you see yourself relating to? Yeah, as far as, uh, you mean it, it, when it comes to the way I look at my work now, or? I think from the 1970s to now, in the 1974, you're using these signs, you said a long time, other people have also used signs. You're also in an area where you've got people like John Cage using aleatoric chance material. Mm -hmm. um, you're sort of leading on after the American experimentalists who use different instruments, extended techniques. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah. I mean, I think at the time I was very much into uh, open form improvisation, and my background was in this. I was I had studied was studying composition, and my background, you know, was in studying composers like you know Charles Ives or Jimi Hendrix or Patsy Cline or you know I had a very wide you know or or, or Boulez or you know a very very wide sort of palette of uh, you know listening as a kid. And uh, so, or there was the painters of Pollock or de Kooning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Doris Lee, uh, Ornald Blanche. There was, I was surrounded by painters and was like, my father was a painter, so I grew up around this. So, so uh, I guess, and then of course, at the time I was studying with the great composer Anthony Braxton, so I had enormous amount of, uh, and of course a great, uh, uh, you know, I really appreciated the work of John Cage and Earl Brown and these other uh, composers. I was really interested in trying to find other ways to structure music. Yeah. And so anybody, whether it be in dance, or whether it was in the visual arts, or whether it was in music, or, or, or whether it was in theater, I was interested in other approaches than the normal boxes that I was finding music to be put in for so many years. I didn't want to put my music in that kind of box. Yeah. You know? So the fundamental philosophy of sound painting as it develops is to generate something in the moment where you have the idea and the ability to structure outside traditional norms. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, at the time, at the time, the, uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, at the time, the, I mean, I was just using the little bit of language that I created to, to steer and guide improvisation. It hadn't become 
the codified, you know, life composing language it is today. It, it was the birth of it then, so, so not only at that time did I use signs, but I would also use signs <laughs> and hold up a red sign with the number two or, yeah. you know, hold up something, a yellow ball that would mean something, you know, so I was really interested in, in, in other ways to, to structure, you know, time. In this time you do this, in this time section you do this, in this time section you do that. So I was really interested in that. And what was really at the foundation for me, the, the basis of, of live composition, you know, structuring in the moment, you know. <laughs> of sound painting Walter could you give us a definition but also illustrates to our viewers how that um, definition has changed over time yes I'm, the, if someone asked me in 1980 let's say or 84 when I had from Woodstock from, moved down to New York City and, f and formed uh, my group the Walter Thompson Orchestra and started and continued to work with sound painting at that time if somebody asked me what is sound painting I would say it's I did say it's a system for guiding and structuring improvisation, usually behind a soloist or, or a, a soloist or, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't really like a live composing tool at the time. And by the time you get to work but one, you still use the term structured improvisation, but it's no longer behind a soloist, is it? Yes, it's the reason I'm revising workbook one right now and it's going to be, be and a new version is coming out soon because I do use the word structured improvisation to, to in the definition of sound painting, and a sound painting at the time, I the the more the years went by, the more I was aware of what I was doing, and the easier it was for me to explain what I was doing. I was doing and not analyzing what it was. I was just doing. It was Sarah Weaver who helped me understand I was working with a specific syntax. You know, so as I as I so this this kind of you know reflection of what I was doing wasn't happening. I was only doing. Yeah. I was diving into the work and creating new signs. And when asked to explain it, I was at odds with myself. I actually didn't know what to say. And it took a number of years, including right up to workbook one, to where I was not really explaining what sound painting was because I wasn't as, uh, you know, adept at being able to, to you were doing it first, Express theorizing and analyzing afterwards. And it's important that you've just said your definition in Workbook 1 has changed. And of course, Workbook 3 is due out. It's finished. So. We've, we've seen the copy. Um, how do you, therefore, now, in 2014, define sound painting? Yeah, I, I, it's very simple. I mean, sound painting is a multidisciplinary, live composing sign language. That's it. So I'm going to pick it's a you, tool. <laughs> I'm going to pick you up on that being simple. What do you mean by live composing? Yeah, you know, what is live composing? Of course, if you know, if if, uh, if Beethoven was alive today and he's sitting down and he's writing, or Carla Bley is writing a piece, or Marion McPartland or somebody is writing a work, or anybody is writing a work, they're alive and they're composing, of course. But this is not what I mean. Uh, live composition is is, uh, I don't know, it's my term, but it's a term I use, is composing in the moment with the group who is realizing the composition. It, it's instant composition. In other words, it's composition happening at the concert instead of before the concert, so to speak, or before the performance. It happens at the moment. The composition is instant. So let's challenge this idea of live composition. A lot of people have argued there is a distinction between composition and improvisation. That one happens in the moment and one happens um, as predetermined material that you rehearse and you take into the performance. It sounds to me that your definition is trailing both of these sides. So in what way is sound painting both improvisation and composition in traditional terms that a composition can be edited and an improvisation effectively can't? You can bring material back, but once it's out there, you can't remove it. Right. I think I, this is something I've had a lot of conversation with, is what is composition. Uh, composers in music do not own the word composition. Composition is, it could be someone who is going out into the yard and composing how they're going to make their, you know, put their plants in the ground. 
for, so I look at composition as a broad word. I don't look at composition as something that is owned by composers in, in, in music. So for me, but to, to address your question, I mean, um, and now I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> now you see the sound painting trailing both composition and improvisation or being something entirely different. Ah, yes. I, I mean, the, first of all, I think of improvisation as composition. It's a form of composition, you know, and, and uh, I can only speak about how I feel about it. I know there's others that feel the same way, and there's others that don't feel that way, and I respect it. But I know that when I sit down and I'm playing my saxophone, you know, I, and it's in a performance situation, or I'm at home and I'm practicing, or I'm playing instead of practicing in that sense. I'm composing. Uh, obviously, I have to compose what, you know, what I'm doing and how it's going to, what kind of timeline it's following, what happen, happens to my, my expression within the, the timeline that's out there for me to work within. Um, so I, I see improvisation as composition. It's a type of composition. But that aside, uh, this, the sound painter, he or she, stands in front of the group. The same ability one has to compose, improvise, as they play, now that's available for a person to have a language like sound painting and actually have that same type of medium, that same way of having it happen in the moment and composing in the moment. The sound painter is improvising with the group. The group is the instrument, and the sound, pain, sound painter improvises with the instrument. Uh, it's, I don't see it very, very, in any different sort of way from me playing the saxophone mm -hmm. and making decisions without really focusing, oh, I'm going to play an F sharp, I'm going to play a G. Not so much that, it's being able to kind of be in the future and not, not caught up in the moment. Mm -hmm. The same thing with sound painting. The composer is there. Mm -hmm. The, the, the language is there, the sound painter improvises with the group using the language, and the result is a composition. So fundamentally you are the ears and the eyes of the ensemble making the choices, and when you don't make the choices, when you want certain chance material, you could be said to give a question or a proposition to that ensemble or to your instrument of people, and for them to offer you something in return. Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, another whole thing. Is what is what's the difference between live composition and what I what I say is traditional composition? In other words, preparing something ahead of time and then handing it to to the group or a conductor to put it, you know, in motion for a performance. Um, uh, there are some things in sound painting that you can you can do, you know, very easily. Um, structures that are very readily available, they would take forever to notate and for example in a scanning you know in scan where you scan by the group and they perform only when your arm passes and you know in front of them and then they stop yeah. and there's a development rate if i was to stay on that person but all of that aside if you imagine like really scanning some sort of complex scan like this and then actually trying to notate that imagine that scan is with a hundred performers just to stay with musicians you know, and you're scanning a hundred musicians like this, and and you go to try to notate that, notate that instead of scanning it. I mean, that, that's uh, and then hand that to a conductor. Yeah. We're talking about a, almost a nightmare here to try to get that performed cor correctly. Um, so that's one of the things that, that uh, a language like sound painting doesn't have over traditional composition, but gives you, uh, you know and inroads into, into structures live that are not available in traditional composition. And then the other way around too, of course, there's certain things that I can notate, you know, and, and I won't be able to notate sort of note for note, for note, so to speak, in sound painting. Now I could use palettes, which would, you know, there's ways of getting that same type of structure, but, uh, well, I know what you want to say, I guess it's, it's, so if we come back to palettes when we talk about uh, music and working with other dancers, we'll illustrate a little bit more about that. But at the moment you've just raised one interesting um, comment about the difference between a sound painter and a traditional conductor. It looks very much at the person at the front of the group. You can see somebody perhaps conducting away, moving like this, but they're not conducting. So what is the fundamental difference between those two? And in what way are certain iconic conducting gestures used? within your creative language? 
Yeah, the, yes, it's one of the, one of the things uh, that I always explain to anybody that's studying sound painting with me is that at times you use conducting skills. If you're saying whole group minimalism, watch me four beats, and then you use four beats to bring in the minimalism, you're using conducting skills in beating a pattern. You might use conducting skills in how you run your rehearsal. Um, you might use conducting skills in, in, in other ways in sound painting and how your body expresses something, you know. Um, and that's all part of a conductor's skills, a director's skills. But a sound painter is not a conductor. Uh, a, the sound painter is the composer uh, the difference, a conductor is somebody who is often given a composition, whether it's hers or his, or somebody else's, and that is a map that then the conductor is, goes to a group and uses that map and basically gives his or her inter interpretation of how he or she wants the group to follow that map. And in the performance, most of the work is already done, but the conductor's up there to remind them where to go on that map. That is not composition. In some small ways, it's elements of composing with what's it's more given. It's interpreting what's given and making some it, decisions. Of it, it's interpreting, which then again could be an argument about whether interpretation is composition in a small, small way. Yep. Forget that. None, <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> that is not composing in my mind. Composing is creating the structures and and uh, and and being present constantly to build and shape and form the piece. And, and although the sound painter, she or he is standing in front of the group like a conductor or maybe off to the side or whatever, that's where the, 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 the sort of the, the comparison comes up. It's only because the person is standing in front that they often get thought of as a conductor. It's two very different roles. Walter, in terms of creating a language, which you've done, how um, have you developed the syntax? What is the syntax and how is it used? Um, well, first of all, I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in our, in our talks, um, I had no idea I was using the syntax. In other words, I didn't sit down and say, okay, I need a syntax for this language. I didn't do that. It just kind of, uh, it happened because it was, it was the way my group could, in New York City, could clearly understand what it was I was doing. So, so of course, that's a syntax, you know, it, but I wasn't sitting down saying, oh, I need who, what, how, when, that type of thing. But that is the syntax of sound painting, who, and so in other words, who, for example, would be the whole group, or who could be woodwinds, or who could be dancers, or who could be actors, or who could be visual artists, you know, or who could be musicians. Um, so those are, those are who gestures, to identify who. And then and Sarah Weaver really sort of, you know, sort of got a handle of this and said, hey, Walter, this is what you're doing. And Sarah said, well, it's really who, what, how, when. So who. And then what, for example, a long tone, or what minimalism, or what, play can't play, or what, coming and going to, you know, what, a content, so who, what, so who, the whole group, what, a long tone, and then how, mm -hmm. sometimes, but quite often, how, pianissimo, you know, using a fader, or if there was a tempo involved, how could be fast, or if, it, or if there were actors in, involved, we could use status, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of faders to say how. Uh, and then when, and it would be a simple play gesture, uh, or, slow, or slowly enter, or mm -hmm. initiate. And again, I'm not standing up, but uh, so it's who, what, how, when. And then to add to that, the important thing is that the sound painter works with four imaginary regions. So those who, what, how, when uh, gestures are put in in different regions that the sound painter works with. The region of neutral, where the, the phrase is put together, and the region called the box in front of the sound painter, where he or she, the sound painter, launches or initiates the content. And then the imaginary staff, mm -hmm. 
for indicating things that are high or low in pitch or sound, uh, or in speed for movement, and then the imaginary stage, stage left, stage right, upstage, midstage, downstage. So that's the basic, the basic uh, uh, structures that the sound painter works with. Thank you, Walter. So you've just mentioned to us there are four imaginary locations that you use as a sound painter. Now you're standing in front of uh, the audience as they're about to sign us. Could you please demonstrate those four things? Yeah, so now I'm standing, in, I'm teaching the audience. <laughs> the, first of all, the four imaginary regions the sound painter uses. And it's the position of neutral for most of the gestures in the phrase. The box, which is an imaginary space in front of the sound page, an imaginary rectangle. The box for initiating the, the phrase. The imaginary staff on the, on the vertical plane for material, for movement that's going to be rapid or for sound that's going to be high in sound or low in sound or middle or fast in movement medium tempo movement, slow movement, dependent on, dependent on the gesture. And then speaking, of, so that's the four imaginary regions the sound painter works with. And then there's the syntax that the sound painter uses in these regions. And, and so for example, with whole group, long tone, volume fader, I'm going to do all of this in neutral. And now I want an immediate entrance for the whole group so that I would then lunge into the box and give a play gesture. And at that moment where this ictus is, this declic, that's when the group comes in. And then I relax and step back to neutral to decide on what is the... I listen, I watch, I decide on what is the next thing to do and to move the composition ahead. Now you mentioned in the first section that you can sign as though you're playing the saxophone and it's an instrument. So what would be really useful for the viewer is if you can demonstrate a variety of signs going the type of speed and agility that you have in front of a group. Yes, yeah, so, you know, it, the sound painting is a language and the more you become comfortable with the physicality of the gestures, it's the same as if you're playing the piano and you practice your scales and chords and what's, what nots and hand and exercises or whatever to, to gain dexterity. So in order to gain dexterity with, with, with sound painting, all of the gestures have to be really comfortable in the body. So when you hear or see something, you don't have to think, oh, how do I make this gesture? You just do it. So for example, if I wanted to kind of move more quickly, uh, let's say, uh, here's what I'll do and maybe I'll explain afterwards. I'll do something really quickly that's, that would be able to um, um, move through the composition as I would playing the saxophone more rapidly, moving through idea to idea. So, for example, For example. Excellent. So we could see you going the who whole group. We could see what started with long term. We could see how in terms of volume and tempo and go. There was also memories in there. Yes, sir, right. In terms of the syntax, can I pick you up the fact we spoke about this being composition, you can edit in the moment. So could you tell us more about memories and the editing process? Right. I called for two memories in that example. And I'm hearing it. I'm imagining the orchestra, multidisciplinary, seeing the dancers, uh, the actors, the musicians, the visual arts. So anyway, that aside, um, started with a long tone, then I asked the strings, you know, to continue and the rest of the group off, and I called the strings, this is memory one. So now memory one means that the strings have to record that material, memorize it immediately, and then I might use it later, or not, but I have it, so it's material that I can bring back a second later, or a minute later, or whatever. And so then I had the strings going, and it was moving quite rapidly. And then I brought in, the, at one point I called a stab freeze, and I said, this is memory two. So now I have two memories that I can then bring back at some point. So, so, so there's, 
this repetition of an idea that's very similar to something you might repeat when you're notating or writing text or choreographing where you bring an idea back to kind of, you know, show something that happened before to create kind of a linear composition in that way to be able to bring ideas back. And so in that short and fast example, I had two memories mm -hmm. and, um, and I was imagining the results and, and uh, uh, with them, yeah. So that's one uh, very clear way to demonstrate editing in the moment. You can bring back material once you've coded it as a memory. There are other ways that you use as well. While you're standing up, could you uh, illustrate for us the idea of going on to and coming back to? Yeah, there's all, all kinds of, you know, uh, there's a memory family, you know, so to go on to something, well, that's, that's, that's not in the memory family, but to go back to is in the memory family. So if I go whole group, long tone, I'll explain go on to a little bit too. Whole group long tone, play, whole group pointillism, play. Now I didn't get a chance to call that long tone a memory, but I thought at the moment I called pointillism that I'd like to go back to the original long tone, but I hadn't signed it a memory, so how do we do that? We say go back to, and that means the previous sign, including exactly that material, you go back to it. So you can go back to something, not necessarily, I mean, you haven't signed it as a memory, but yet you can still go back and grab it mm -hmm. as something you can use later. And then you go back to it and you give a play gesture. Now you might want it as a memory and you call it a memory. Uh, go on to is something you, it's, it's, it's not a memory family, it's something that you give to performers like, you know, woodwinds, long tone, go on to pointillism, go on to minimalism, and then maybe a play gesture. And they play each one of those contents for a, a defaulted maybe 30 seconds and then they stop and continue with the last content. So that's go on to. Okay, thank you for demonstrating the uh, movements and the use of memories in particular and go on to and go back to. I'd like to um, challenge you a little bit that as a performer, if I'm performing while you're signing, I'm not just thinking about you as the score and reading note for note for note. If you're going to say go back to and, and go on to, I need to be thinking about behind and in front of me all the time. So how do you use that and how do you train your ensembles and your pupils to develop that? Well, exactly, I mean, what is a sound painting performer? Like what is required, you know, to become a fluent sound painting performer, a responder to those, to the gestures, to the phrases? And one of them is the ability to memorize in the moment, to be able to um, you know, like you've called something complex, like a complex minimalism, and and it's, you know, some so of minimalism done, with high complex. Yeah, minimalism, and it's a complexity fader. The complexity fader. So this is a very complex cycle that the person is doing, and maybe it's a fifteen eight or something like this, and it's very complex. You know, um, and then I call memory while somebody's doing that. <laughs> well, you know, one would hope that that person that chose something in 15 <laughs> would be able to remember it. So if the sound painter calls that and they really haven't explained to the performers, their role mm -hmm. as a performer in sound painting is to be able to memorize, be able to think both in, in the past and in the future and the present. It's a different job in a way, you know, than the, than the performer in a, in a more classical situation uh, where they're not necessarily required to do that, except for in open form improvisation where it just happens naturally. But uh, so the job of the sound, the sound painter performer is to sort of really like live in these, the world of the now, the future, and the, and the past, and to be able to call on those things. Now, um, there is no reason to be perfect about that as the performer. There is absolutely no reason that someone needs to say, oh, I can't really do that. You just simply try to do as much as you can. So if I call for this person that shows 15-8 and he or she has never been called in the memory and it's the very first time and I call it and then I bring it back and say we're in concert, the, and the person has not exactly the, the right response, you know, it's not exactly the same material, well, for me, that's okay, you know, uh, uh, the, that's a risk I take. And for me, in live composition, the risk is a big part of it. And of course, in sound painting, the error ex doesn't exist. If you make an error, keep going, just don't stop. So, so let's so, just clarify that. You've just said there's no error in sound painting. How and why? 
that is a fundamental philosophy. So can we iterate that very clearly? Yes, and it, and it, speak, it, it speaks to this situation where you know this person in 15-8 couldn't do the memory, but it was okay that he or she came back in with what they could come back in with. In sound painting, the, the only error is stopping when you make an error. And, and um, I mean, why? I mean, uh, great uh, visual artists and performers have, for, throughout the years have said that the error really doesn't exist. I mean, you, I mean, it does exist if you're reciting something in this, this specific words you're supposed to follow and you say the wrong word. Well, that's an error. But in sound painting, because we're dealing in the, the world and the realm of live composition, it's much easier for the composer, the sound painter, to deal with an error, to take that material that you least expect and do something with it. It's much easier to do that than it is for, to receive an error and then to have the person kind of do whoops and then stop or try to switch to the correct content, that is a big, the energy in the piece just falls out at that point, and that one person brings other people down around him at the same time. So if the error, if it's like, oh, I meant to do that, if you can kind of keep that, oh, I meant to do that concept going, you're going to have a much stronger composition, and it's up to you, the sound painter, to deal with it, and many times the error is, uh, is, really very interesting material to deal with. It's like, whoops, I didn't expect that, uh, but, you know, I know how to deal with anything that comes at me, so thank you for the gift, the error is a gift. So we come straight back to what we discussed in section one, that your reason for developing sound painting actually was not to panic about an error or something that wasn't going according to plan, but to work with it, to develop it, to see, see it as a challenge and to think what you can do to develop that. Exactly, to see what can I do. To, to develop an error, you know, say I say whole group long tone, you know, and and uh, uh, somebody comes in with portalism just by accident. Well, what do you do at that point? You know, there's a lot of choices. I mean, and you can think of, you know, 20 things to do at that point. So a simple one would be to say to that person that's made the point the error and played portalism instead to say, you know, maybe that's, uh, you know, whoever, let's just stay with musicians at this point to make it simple. It could be any discipline, but let's say it's Woodwind One, made the error, Woodwind One, continue, rest of the group, stop. Now we have the Woodwind One playing pointillism when, when it was supposed to be long tone. Uh, and now Woodwind One's been asked to continue with the pointillism, and then maybe I say rest of the group scan with pointillism, and, and from the error comes the next section of the composition. And then I scan with pointillism. You know, so I, I tend to use the error um, almost immediately when it happens to, to, to include it in the composition instead of leave it there as some kind of whoops. You know. <laughs> discussion of the syntax, there's a number of uh, terms that you've already used that I think it's worth us um, unpacking and decoding a little bit, and one of those has been defaults. There are some very basic defaults, sort of preset things that you have a requirement to do. Could you illustrate what those are? Yeah, a default is, uh, uh, without showing the sign, but a default. A default is sort of used in two different ways, and a default is that um, for example, when I use point to point and I point at somebody, the gesture is defaulted with what's called rate number one, rate one of the rate development rate number one. And uh, so it's defaulted that that's part of, it's one of the parameters of the gesture. So that's, or scanning is defaulted to use rate one, play can play is defaulted to use rate two. So that's a default, it's a rule that's built in to, it's one of the parameters of the gestures, but it's a default in the sense why that and not just a parameter, it's because it's a default that can be changed. It can be, the other parts of what point to point is or scanning are not Change, otherwise it doesn't. It's not point to point of scanning anymore. But the default can be modified to uh, point to point instead of using default one. Can be modified to use the default two or default three for that matter. So um, there are two issues in there. I'm sorry. The, um... Rate one, rate two, rate three. Sorry, is what I meant to say. It can be 
you can use rate one, rate two, or rate three development. You can re-default the gesture. So there's two issues there, that the default is a rule that can be adapted, not entirely changed, but adapted. So for example, me as a trumpet player, playing when you're signing, you default me to sit down when I'm playing, unless told otherwise. You default an actor to sit down. You, you've you not got the ability when you say whole group minimalism to do that by standing up. Exactly, that's another default. A default is you know, a, a rule of like, uh, speaking multidisciplinary, uh, a default would say, okay, you know, actor one, when, when performing a long tone, don't use your arms, don't move, only use your voice for the long tone. Or say a dancer is asked to get up and, and maybe, you know, dancer one, improvise something simple, right? I mean, using the gesture, improvise. Use the whole space and, the, and slowly enter, enter. The dancer gets up and then the sound painter signs for the dancer to finish what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when they're done, the question that would come up in a situation like this is, well, does the dancer st stop in place or does the dancer go back to the chair? Well, that's a default. Mm -hmm. So normally the default is that they return to their chair, but in the performance you might want to have the dancers stay where they are and um, for a number of reasons so you might use the default sign which is this mm -hmm. default one might mean to go back to the chair and before you make the phrase for the dancers or, or actors or anybody moving in the space to do something you would call default two which might mean to stay in place when i call the whole group off leaving with default two the performers that are moving in the space to remain where they are instead of re returning to default one, mm -hmm. which would mean to go back to the chair. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for a live composer yourself or anybody else to have a series of parameters that if they want to call on something, they need to think about the defaults beforehand. Right. You. you yes. I and mean, if you're working if, if you, as a live composer, there's something something that's so important to make this, you know, this relationship between the group you're working with, the instrument for the sound painter, so to speak, you know, and, and the sound painter, this relationship between the two. So there's, so it's very clear, what do I do when, when, I, when I'm not doing this? Or what do I do when you ask the whole group to stop and I'm a dancer out in, out in you know, downstage left? What am I going to do then? Do I go back to my chair? Do I sit on the edge of the stage? Do I go out and buy a Coke? I mean, what, what do I do? <laughs> You know, so it's really important. So this is live. You have to have all of these defaults set up. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of um, ambiguity, you know, in the performance. Like the performers will be lost about what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's the other side of defaults. The, the rules of what to do, you know, when asked to stop. Do I return to my chair? Do I stand in place, etc. Okay, so within this section talking about the syntax, there's one other um, point I really want to probe you on, which you've already introduced, and this is the rate of development. You've already said in um, terms of point-to-point -point and scanning that there's a particular rate of development, and you spoke about the fact there are three of them. Could you iterate the different rates of development and the types of signs that they relate to? Right, yes. First of all, the, uh, the reason that I created uh, rates of development uh, and is because... Uh, at one point, when I when there were when there was only five or six gestures in sound painting early on, uh, I didn't think about any any such thing. The more the language developed, the more I became interested in signing and creating more signs to mean different things, and the more I realized that when I was scanning early on, that every time I stopped on somebody, it was full blown improvisation. I mean, there was, you know, there wasn't much difference. It was really hard to compose because the person would just, ju the performer would just jump right out at the first opportunity to really just improvise in a very open way, you know, yeah. and the rate for that person would be for, open for them to develop at whatever rate they wanted. So I found it impossible to compose because no matter whether I was calling play can't play or point to point or scanning, I was getting quite a lot of the same sort of response. So rate one, I created development rate one, which in, for like in scanning and point to point, for example, which, which incorporates rate one, you, you have to develop your material. The first idea that comes out, like if it's point to point and say I 
point at myself for an example and I say, Bonjour! 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 I'm going to continue saying bonjour and, and develop that. You know, I'm, instead of saying something like, you know, Bonjour! Qu'est-ce que tu fais? Hey, je suis ici! Instead of saying a whole bunch of other things and going off into a tangent and speaking about this and speaking about that, I'm so, gonna, could you illustrate where, where, where the bonjour would be 30 seconds later? Yeah, 30 seconds later, say, you know, because you want to hang on to, in rate one, you want to hang on to that first motif, you know, that first idea, and build from it and keep bringing it back into the, into the improvisation, uh, uh, is, or into the development of your material as much as you can. And so, bonjour after 30 seconds might be, bonjour, oui, uh, uh, oui, bonjour, je, je te dis, ah, bonjour. So I keep bringing bonjour back, mm -hmm. you know, back, so, and I add to it, and maybe after one minute or more, a little bit longer, I'm not saying bonjour so much, or maybe not saying it at all, but, but or using... Or saying it, but and adapting it. There's yeah. an example you often use when you're in workshops, which is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, as the, uh, the opening rhythm being uh, illustrative of rate one development, because it's repeated, it's adapted and, yeah. and developed across the different instruments. Um, so can we move on to rate two and what the difference yes, is? Yes, rate two. Rate two is in gestures like develop, which is by default rate two, and play can't play, which is a, is, is a rate two gesture. And rate two is simply twice as fast as rate one. Whereas in rate one, you know, hello, you know, hello, 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 uh, what? hello, and I keep using hello in rate one. Now in rate two, if I'm using something like hello, and let's just say I've, I'm, okay, we use uh, play can't play, mm -hmm. right? And let's say I chose to do hello in play can't play, and I, so, Hello, um, what are you trying to say over there? I, 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 hello, is it? Hello's okay. Hello's, hello's pretty good to say. Uh, hello to you too, and hello, hello to those people over there. Hello is, uh, you know what? I think that I'm not going to say that anymore. It's, uh, no, no, I, I really don't think so. And, and so I've moved away from hello a little bit more rapidly than I would in rate two, but just to, just to explain that I'm using hello. A bit in the beginning, but I move away from it more. So it's a motivic idea. It's like a kernel that keeps coming back and punctuates that overall right. fluid line that you're creating. Especially in rate one, you can hear that first idea. You can hear some of it in some way a minute later. Mm -hmm. And in rate two, you can hear a bit of that first idea maybe 30 seconds later. Uh, but a minute later, you won't, you won't, hear, you won't hear that idea. So rate three, I'm guessing, is going to be improvisation, of course. The sign for improvise um, is, and for a yeah, for the improviser, uh, he or she can develop how they want. It's uh, at that point, if I sign someone improv improvise, at that point, that person is a co-composer with me in a sense. You know, I'm giving them uh, the space to 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 give me their art. You know, give me your art. Give. Just go, I will support you and be behind what you're doing or, you know, contrast you in some kind of way or not or whatever. But, but at that point, it's a, it's a, it's a co-composing relationship, you know. I think this is really useful to clarify the syntax. We've gone over the structure of being uh, who, what, how and when. We've spoken about defaults, the things that need to be in place, the rules so that a live composer can work with the performer. And we've spoken about rates of development. And within that we've spoken about the imaginary box and the imaginary um, sort of staff that you have as the composer. So to wrap up this section on the syntax, what aspirations do you have in terms of developing the syntax or developing the language? Where, for example, would you, would you like it to be in sort of 10, 20 years? Yeah, well, yes, I mean, I, I sort of, in 10 or 20 years from now, I would just like to see more people, of course, using this tool uh, in education and in the professional, education and the professional arena. I would like to see it used as much as possible as many countries around the world. Uh, as far as the language developing, um, you know, every year we have a sound painting think tank, which is a, which is a conference uh, where I invite people to come together with me someplace. It's whether it was at Kingston University last year in London, or this year, at, you know, in Spain, or whether it was in France in Tours, or whether it was in Helsingborg in Sweden, 
or on Woodstock, New York, wherever it was, in the summer about 35 sound painters come together and we talk, we share ideas and we talk about what we did during the year and a, a new situation had come up, how do we sign it, do we need a new gesture for it. So in 10 or 20 years from now I would like to, to see that that process continues and that, that new gestures become codified, you know, in other words, what is codification in sound painting. There's no committee that, that chooses, you know, to do so. It's just, <laughs> if someone creates a, lang uh, a gesture like Jennifer Ray felt, you know, creating sprinkle, which is used a lot by many sound painters, if somebody creates a gesture and, and sound painters use it, then it becomes part of the language, just, just like the spoken language. So we could, there's an analogy with the Oxford English Dictionary, that's a word that's been used quite a lot, or would be inserted into, into the common use, it's shared, um, the definition's the same, the way in which the sign is used is identical, so long term's always going to be this, it's not going to change to something else, just as a, sort of a word for a cup, it's always going to be a cup, it's not going to change to something else. I hope not. <laughs> Only because, you know, we speak about the, what, is, what is, again, to answer more about this 10 or 20 years, looking into the future of the 10 or 20 years, what is sound painting then? It, for me, I, it, it, part of my mission as an artist is to get it out there as a, as a universal tool. You know, it's a tool, so somebody coming from Iran or coming from you know, Tanzania or coming from, you know, New Jersey or coming from Sweden or London or wherever, that they can go to a sound painting class, group, whatever, ensemble in another city, town, and, and speak the same language to be able to compose. Just like the language of music is, is pretty much universal, I would like to see sound painting as a tool in performance um, to, to, make, to, 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 to be universal from this point to 10,000 years in the future. I want it to stay universal instead of separate. You know? Excellent. So challenging you a little bit, we're there's a vast number of people using this creative language across the globe now. Um, are there any limitations within sound painting? Uh, yes, of course. I, I mean, are there limitations? I mean, as an artist, if you want to be a sound painter, there's, for me, there's no limitations, you know, because I can continue to, to grow. And I'm always growing by watching all these other wonderful sound painters that are around now. I learn from them enormously in these think tanks. I'm not only there to develop the language in there, I'm there to steal all of their ideas. <laughs> I will steal your idea. If you don't show it to me, I will steal it. And <laughs> <laughs> This is because it's a language, you share the language, it's not uh, sort of stealing an object, it's inserting um, a particular gesture within the language so that it's used, it's shared, it's universal. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and sorry, state the, the your question. So it's not limited in the sense that the language is giving a proposition yes, for creativity. Yeah. It's, it's not saying you have to work within a jazz style, you've got to work No, no, it. exactly. No, it's, it's not limited. If you want to do something that sounds like a Bach chorale or you want to do something that looks like a, something Twyla Thart might have choreographed or if you want to like reference somebody else or or be a funk group, you know, like, you know, it, there's different sound painting funk groups like Mysterium, fantastic group, this, and it's a funk based group that uses sound painting. I, there's no limitations in that way. What I meant to say are, is, you know, when I said that there were some limitations, what I mean by that is, is that between live composing and, and traditional composing, if you will, there's of course certain kinds of limitations, like anybody that can sit down and write something, it's a whole different medium, an entirely different medium than someone who uses a codified sign language that's known by all to create composition in the moment. In between those two worlds, they're, they're both limited in some way, but to be an artist within those two worlds, there's no limitation. Mm -hmm.